Amen. Amen. Okay. We are a training ground here in our church. That's what we do. We train you how to live your life. We train you how to train others how to live their life. And in God, in Christ, and what our weapons are, how we go about, how we're supposed to walk around this world, and what we're supposed to do. Today, we're going to address communion. Because we take it every single week here, which is not typical for most churches. Most churches, maybe once a month, sometimes not, maybe once a quarter. But we're kind of weirdos. And if you didn't know why, I want to tell you why. And here's why I want to tell you why. Because if you know why we do it here, then you'll know why you can also do it at home. And you will unleash the power that is behind communion. And it is life changing. It is life altering in the best of ways. But if you don't understand it, then you won't do it. And if you don't do it, then it's not going to work for you. Still going to heaven, still getting through the doors, still living an okay life, but you will not have that power that comes with the revelation of what communion is to you. So we do not, I never want to do anything in this church that's just because we, it's what we've always done, so that's why we're doing it. I never want to get to that place. I don't want it to be a ritual, ever. So we're telling you the reason, so that it is definitely not a ritual. Wait, I did a pretty graphic. There you go. Isn't that nice? Yeah, I thought so too. What, the fights that we fight are not natural. The fights that we fight are spiritual. When you have... Let's talk about sickness in particular. When you have sickness that feels like a natural thing that's in your body, your back hurts, your toe hurts, your eye hurts, your head hurts, whatever it is, you've gotten the bad report. That is something physical that's happening to your body, but it is a spiritual thing that is happening. And so what we're talking about today is the communion for many things, but for healing of your physical body. And it is a beautiful, once you understand it better, it is a beautiful, you're not going to take it the same ever again. It is a beautiful representation, it is a beautiful, powerful authority that you have when you do it. And so this is what we're going to like, pull apart today. Now, what they, they call communion the Lord's Supper. They call communion the food that heals. I want to make a point. Sometimes God will give you things to do for your life specifically. He may say, don't eat gluten. He may say, eat more vegetables. He may give you specific. And we have people in this church that have been healed by listening to what God told them to do, what God told them to stop putting in their bodies or to put into, into their bodies. That goes along with this. I'm not negating that in any way. But what I'm saying is, if you think about it, Back in Jesus' time, when he led his disciples in communion, everyone was on the Mediterranean diet. There weren't pesticides back then. And they were still sick and weak and dying. Why? Because, well, we live in a fallen world. But there is only so far that Taking your nutritional, dotting all your nutritional I's, crossing all your nutritional T's is going to get you. Do not neglect that. We're not going to eat like a bunch of teenagers whose parents have left them for the weekend and a debit card. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. However, we need to make sure that we are incorporating this into it because this is more powerful than anything that you're going to be told to put into your body because Jesus told us exactly what to do. Now, in the Old Testament, the communion was shadowed by the Passover meal. So think about back in the Old Testament, the first Passover was when the plague was coming and the firstborn in every household was going to be killed. And so Jesus, God said, told his people, he said, through Moses, he said, you sacrifice a lamb, you take that blood, you put it on the doorpost which is also the sign of the cross, across and down the sides. And you take that blood and you eat that lamb inside your homes. And when you do that, your home will be spared. 
Oh, I will tell you because it's in the scripture. I even have it for you. It says, now the blood shall be a sign on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague will not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day, think about this. Remember this. This day shall be to you a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Why do you think that he wanted us to do this? Why do you think he told them, I want you to do this now, and I want you to remember and do this consistently. This is going to be part of the feast process that they had to do every year. Why? Well, I'm going to tell you why. It is to remember what the salvation was for them on that day, and then in the future to remember the salvation of our Lord. And that's one of the reasons, spoiler alert, that's why we're still doing it today. This is why we do it every week. This is why when I'm sick, I do it daily, if not multiple times a day. To remember what he has done for me. To remember where I was and where I am. I want to point out a couple of things about this. The Israelites... God's chosen people were spared because of the symbol, the sign of the blood and eating of the lamb inside the home. Now, none of their animals or children were killed. Do you think that every single person who partook of that and who did what they were told to do, did it in faith and confidence? Probably not. Because, let's not forget what was happening. They were in their land, the land right next to them, the Egyptians, the, the people, the firstborn, were being killed. You don't think you could hear that? You're sitting there eating your lamb, your blood's over, and you don't think you could hear what's happening down the road? And the anguish of people losing their ch firstborn child and the firstborn of all their animals, of, their, of all their livestock, you did hear that. So what was in what you were doing was because God told you to. What you were hearing was what was happening to those who didn't. And what your head did not have to be in a perfect place. And I think this is important for us today because sometimes we put so much emphasis on you have to believe 100% right and never waver and never. And there is some truth to the fact that you need to believe what God told you in his word. There's absolutely truth, not some truth that is truth. But you cannot put yourself under condemnation if some weird thoughts happen through your head in the meantime. We talked about this the other week, that the devil cannot read your mind. When those weird thoughts come, just keep your mouth shut about the weird thoughts. Better yet, open it up to say whatever it is that your promise is that you're standing on. Are you standing on those? They, were, they literally could hear the destruction happening, but they and their household was saved. That's the same way when we do communion. When I, do, when, when I partake of communion, when I receive communion into my body, it is not uncommon for me to have a headache, a stomach ache, something in my bank account that's not working, something in my kid's life that's not working. I can see it, I can hear it, and my mind might try to take me down to that dark path, but I'm not going to be moved. I'm going to continue to do what he told me to do, which is stand on the promises and partake of communion. That's one of the things that I'm doing. I'm also doing some of the other things that he told us to do, like reading his word, building ourselves up in the word, praying in the spirit. There's those other things, but today we're talking about this one thing because it is such a vast, it is so important. And you don't just have to do it here. Your posture is based in the blood, not in what you see, not in what you feel. And it says that, so what happened is, you remember the story. So this plague happened. Pharaoh said, get out. I'm done. Go. So the Israelites left. It is estimated that there were about three million of them. 
And it says in Psalms, he also brought them out with silver and gold, which is another wonderful part of the story. And there was none feeble among the tribes. Now, I don't know if you've seen some movies that talk up that they look and they've got the old people on their little canes and they have them in their stretchers and they're just trying to get across. That's really cute, but it's not biblical. Because see, my Bible says, and yours does too, that there was none feeble among the tribes. Now, how old are these people? Were they all young bucks? No, they were not. They were old. They were young. They were all, they were tr- all the tribes. You had from babies to old people. And old was old back then. And they were slaves. They were working all the time. And there was none feeble among them. So that is how the Lord delivered, despite the movie. That is how they left and they walked into their next step of their journey, which was they were freed and they now started toward the promised land. Now, after the exodus, after they left, then the Lord fed them, and he fed them with manna, and we're going to look at that. He said he rained down, he rained, I got real southern there, he said, and he rained down manna on them to eat, and given them of the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full. And that's beautiful, but the actual translation is a little bit incorrect, but guess what? It's actually better. What that translation, instead of men ate angels' food, it's supposed to read, men ate the food of the mighty. The food of the mighty. And that is manna from heaven. The food of the mighty is that manna. Well, here's what's good news for you today. We have not had manna that has rained down on the dew outside. I didn't see it in the yard when we came up because we don't need it anymore because we have something better. Every day that manna was provided fresh. It says, and when the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna fell on it. It wasn't even dried out. It was nothing like the communion that we're eating today. It was, it was provided for them every day as they needed it, and twice on the day before the Sabbath, so that it, they were to get it fresh daily. Remember that. This is a type and shadow of communion for where we are today. It is provided fresh daily, like the mercies are renewed every morning. The communion is fresh daily. Their manna was fresh every single day. Every single day it was provided fresh. Jesus now is our manna. So you read what this says right here, and then you look at the beauty and how similar it's. When you read them together, there's no doubt that this is what it's talking about. Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Communion does not impart salvation. The Bible is very clear about how you're saved. You believe You say it with your mouth, you receive him. That is how salvation happens. Salvation does not happen by communion. It is very clear, however, here that he's talking about that when you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, if you don't do that, you have no life in you. Now, you have eternal life when when you receive salvation. This is talking about the life that's in your body. By what? By communion. This is how we reverse that curse. This is how your spirit is saved. This is how we get life into the body. Into, because we are a three-part being. We are a spirit. We live in a body. And we have a mind. Soul, mind, will, and emotions. That's how those other parts, your spirit is living forever. As soon as you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your spirit now lives forever. You never have to experience death again. Your spirit's living forever either, forever either way, actually, but you will live in heaven. You will never have to experience death again in your spirit, but this is how you get life in your body, in all the parts. In the parts that get sick, in the part in your head that gets kind of crazy sometimes, this is how you receive it. This is how you receive it. 
Now, I want to look at this overall story. Hang with me. It's so good. Yes, you know it. But do you? Because there's little tidbits in here that I even, when I was refreshing my mind to this, that I was like, that's right, I did remember that. So, in Luke it talks about when the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins, right there. So this is happening when? This is happening on the Passover. Remember when it said, you must remember this day? Well, he's remembering this day, the Passover day. Interesting, don't you think, that this is the, that Jesus himself, the Passover lamb, is celebrating Passover with his disciples, with his people. It clearly, as right now, they are partaking of the Passover meal. For I tell you that I won't meet the, eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God, a type and shadow that's about to be completely fulfilled. The thing they've been celebrating every year is now fulfilled, well, is about to be fulfilled. He took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it amongst yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread, gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. You know, it's amazing what you can see when you just slow down a minute and you don't just read it out of religion. The question is, is communion here a symbol only? Is communion just something that we're doing as a nice remembrance? Think about this as we're going through. And then he says, And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and we had given thanks. He gave it to them. And they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. So Mark is the, is the book that is, so we read originally in Luke, but Mark is the most accurate gospel chronologically. And that's important here, and here's why. Because if we're asking the question, is the communion a symbol? Because some, some religions believe that the bread and the wine literally turn into the body and the blood of Jesus. So we need to address that because we live in this world. We need to know what we're doing. We need to know, is that accurate, or is it just a sign of something? Is it just a symbol of something? So when it says here in Mark, I think the order of when Jesus talked about it is very significant. And here's why. Jesus explained it. He says to them, he says, take, eat, this is my body. Then they drank from it. And then he said, after... He gives it to them. He gives them the elements. They partake. After they partake, he says, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Hmm. That's significant, and here's why. Because is he saying that when we hold the communion in our hand, it is bread and it is, in our case, grape juice. But when we partake it, after we have it into our physical bodies, that's when it becomes holy. That's when it becomes uncommon. Because guess what? I can drop this communion on the floor and my dog could eat it, but my dog's not getting the healing effects from it. I, as a spiritual being, who knows what is happening, who is remembering what he did for us, when I partake of it, it changes who I am. It changes my phys I am still a spirit that's saved. I was that before and I was that after. But my body physically is changed because it is, it is the food of the Lord is going inside and affecting a change inside my physical body. So I do not believe that when we hold it in our hands before we put it into our mouths that it is anything other than what it is. It is 
a dry cracker and grape juice, or whatever it is that you have at home that you're using. The elements are not what's important. So at that point, it is a symbol. But as soon as you partake it with the knowledge of what you're doing, it changes from a symbol to the uncommon, very holy elements of the Lord's body and blood. Let's read, let's read what Paul's account is. I'm going to read through it real quick, and then we're going to dissect it a bit. Because Paul was not there for the original time that Jesus was talking about communion. He was not there for the Last Supper. That's not what Paul's deal was. But Paul did find out about the communion from Jesus himself. He, was, he heard about it, he talked to Jesus about it, and now he's writing about it. And he's writing about it, context is key, right? So remember this when we're reading. Paul is writing to the church of, in this, what I'm about to read, into the church of Corinth. And they were a hot mess. They were getting a ton of stuff wrong. And they needed to be, some things needed to be explained to them and they needed to get it right. Because they needed some help. So when Paul says here, for I received from the Lord, that means that he didn't, he wasn't there. He received it when he spoke with the Lord, that which I also delivered to you. So he got it and he told it that the Lord Jesus on the same night, and then he goes through what happened. The Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed on the Passover, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Did you notice, though, and one of the things I want you to pay attention to, is he is quoting... And then he's explaining. So now he is explaining. He is saying, for as often as you eat this bread, Church of Corinth, as as often as you drink this bread, as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're going to circle back to that because it's good. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And that right there is why I passed up communion multiple times when I was a kid. Because I figured, that's bad. I don't know much, but that's not good. Even when I was little, little, because we took a time in our church service, and we sat there with our heads down and our eyes closed, and we examined our hearts, and we were like, okay, is there any sin in us? Is there anything that I haven't asked the Lord to forgive me for? Is there anything that I've done this week that is bad? Or this month, or this quarter, because we didn't do it often. Is there anything at all? And I would have to let that communion go straight beside me as I was sitting next to my mom, by the way. So then there was a talk after. (laughs) Kimberly Michelle, what's up? What sin have you done? Because she didn't have a revelation of it either. Not then. She did before she went to heaven, but she didn't then. So she was going to try to help me out of whatever it was, which was a kind thing to do, because what did I know? I was just a kid. But I went to a, let's not forget, I went to Christian schools up until high school. So we were being taught every day what these things meant under the law. So I was pretty good at the law. And so was mom, because she taught there too. So, um, yeah, that, that was uncomfortable, to say the least. And in high school, I'll be honest with you, I just faked it. I was like, no, nothing wrong with me. Here, take it. Mm, 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 mm. No problem over here. Thank the Lord he does not judge us for stupid stuff that we do. But let a man examine himself, so, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. That sounds really simple, doesn't it? But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. So when it says in the yellow, for this reason, if you look back, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this reason, many are weak and sick among you. Context, let's not forget. 
Context is key. Let's start from a little bit before that verse because it says, Paul talks about what they're doing. If you go before what I just read, it talks about, therefore, this is... This is Paul talking to the church. It says, therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. This is what they're doing. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. They were not discerning that the Lord's Supper was anything different than what a regular meal was. They were doing it drunk. They were getting drunk off the wine. They, I told you they were a hot mess, and they were a hot mess. So this is who he's talking to. Like, this is Corinthians 11. And what am I reading from? I'm also reading from Corinthians 11. This is 20 and 21. I started at 23. It's right there. He's talking to the same people. So when you know that that's who he's talking to, then you can better understand why he's saying the things that he's saying. Context is key. So when you go forward and you go through and start to read it, and in the same manner he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do in remembrance, oh, this do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Okay, in remembrance of me. When you take the cup, it is not just the ritual. It is when you take the cup and when you take the bread, you're going to do this remembering him, remembering what he did. Remembering what he did for you, remembering the blood that saved you, remembering the body that was broken for your healing. That is what you're doing when you do it in remembrance of me. That is key in what we're talking about. The Old Testament depended on your works. The New Testament depends on his blood. That's how we can be where we are today and not be perfect and still live in a better place than what the people did before us, than what the Old Testament people did. Because now he no longer sees our sin. Because of why? Because of the blood. He no longer judges us. Why? Because of the blood. But look at this. It says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, this means every time that you do this, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. I have read over that, and I've said it multiple times. And I've led communion a lot in this job that I have. And it, I kind of go over, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Yeah, that's great and that's wonderful. But did you know that this is, it's like you are proclaiming that the Lord died for you. It is like the will. You are proclaiming that this was done for us 2,000 years ago. You're proclaiming that with this, it's as if he just died for what you're proclaiming. You are saying that Jesus died for this salvation, that this blood was shed for my salvation, that his back was whipped and he was beaten for my healing. By taking communion, you are proclaiming that between now and the time that he comes. So remember how they said the Passover, they were supposed to remember the Passover every single year because of what the Passover did? This is the same thing, but we don't have to wait anymore. We don't have to wait for once a year or once a month or once a week. Every time you partake of communion, you are saying, I remember what he did. And I am saying that in my body, this is now present and this is a done deal. This is no longer something that's going to happen in the sweet by and by. This is something that is alive in me right now. And you don't have to think about it again. You proclaim the Lord's death every single time when you remember him. This is how we show God our love. You know how, you know, and I love this about the youth. They're talking about what your love language is. I didn't know that until I was a grown-up. They're talking about, like, how, how do you best receive love. Like there's the five love languages and they get to understand and learn about them and learn how it relates to them in the Bible and even them in their calling and about how they relate to other people. That is phenomenal. We don't teach kids dumb down stuff in this church. We teach on their level, but we don't teach the stupid stuff. We teach useful things for them to go out into that lost and dying world and not go under. This is God's love language. When you say, I remember what you did for me. I remember 
that you sent your son to die for me. I remember when he hung up on the tree on that cross for me. And that now what that provided for me. And every single time that you partake of communion and you receive that, you are showing the Lord that you remember his Jesus' death. When? Between now and the time he comes. Every single time. It is beautiful. It is love. It is intimacy with God. It is nowhere near a ritual that we are supposed to be doing. And if that's what it's become for you, stop, because you're missing so much of it. You can do it, but why? Do it with the knowledge of what is happening, what happened then, what's happening now, and what's happening in your body as, as you partake. It is not the law. It is absolutely love. Then it says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. When you partake conscious of your sin, that's the unworthy manner. You are partaking saying that what you did, what your sin was, was more important than what the blood of Jesus did. That's, that is the unworthy manner. It is not whether or not you sinned. Why? Because everything changed to the cross. Old Testament was, yes, absolutely, what you did, 100% mattered, and it mattered with your standing with God. In the New Testament, post-cross, it does not matter what, what, sins you have ever cre- whatever, what sins you have ever committed. It matters the blood. The blood is the only thing that matters at that point. We do not want to take this in an unworthy manner, meaning... We have to take it remembering what it did for us. That is what it is. It is not based on sin. You don't have to do, have your hands trembling whether or not you're going to be struck down when you take communion because you forgot about yelling at your brother last night. You don't have to worry about that. I wouldn't suggest yelling at your brother, but that's a whole nother thing. That's a whole nother thing. So, okay, so it gets a little bit worse, right? But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Like, it like, keeps, seems like a harps on it, right? Doesn't it? That word examine means to view for approval. Because see, for me, examine has always meant like, oh, I got to find out and make sure that I don't have any sin in there. Let's look deep inside. Do I have any unconfessed sins, sins of omission, sins of commission? What are, like, where, what is it that I need to do? This is examine for approval, yourself. Well, let me ask you this. Are you approved of the Lord? Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. That's how you're discerning the body. That's how you're examining yourself. You're examining yourself to be, to find the approval that was provided by the very elements that you're taking. You are looking for the good. Did you know the whole time, have you noticed this? And I, I'll be honest, until I'd studied for this sermon, I did not realize this part. This whole time, he says, remember me. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember me. Remember what I did for you. Remember what these things mean. Never once does he say, remember your sins and look at yourself. He says, examine yourself, but that means look for the good in yourself. Until we get to this pretty word that comes later, which is judge. So we're going to talk about that one too. But you are always looking for what he did. Remember me. Don't remember your sins. That's a key, people. That is very key. You remember him. Do not remember you. Actually, the entire act of communion is getting yourself out of the way. Because what you're doing is no longer important. What you receive is important. And who you are because he said who you are is what's important. Because, see, if you continue to look at yourself in whatever way, whether it's sin, whether it's sickness, whether it's whatever, you insert your problem here. When you are looking at that, instead of when you're partaking of communion, looking at what Jesus did and having that mental picture, and that's one of the things I do love about the passion. If I am ever super sick, I do not particularly love to watch the passion, the movie, because it is heartbreaking for me. But when I'm really sick, I do watch it, and here's why. Because I can see the love that was in it. I can see that he overpaid for my sickness. He overpaid for my sin. And it reminds me that my little piddly stuff is nowhere near what he did for me. 
And it totally took that away, and it reminds me, and it gives me that mental and that physical eyeball image to say, this is how much he loved me, and to accept anything less is to say what he, say, what he did for me isn't enough. And that seems ridiculous when I'm watching that. When I'm watching the blood fall, the, when I'm watching the entire picture, it's ridiculous that I think that what I do could change what he did. It's ridiculous. So I do like it for that reason. So let's move on. It says, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Okay. I, didn't, I had to read this like five times to get it. When you... He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, and we talked about what that is, when that is paying more attention to what you did rather than what he did, when you were not remembering what he did for you. But when you do that, you drink judgment to yourself. That does not mean that you will be judged. If you go back into the Greek, the Hebrew, the Greek, when you look at those words, it's talking about that you were judging yourself. It doesn't talk about the judgment comes from God. And it even says it. You eat and drink judgment to yourself because you are aware of the judgment sh that should be on you. Why? Because you're not discer discerning the Lord's body. Th that word discernment there means you're not distinguishing. You're not separating. You're not separating the cup and the, you're not separating the blood and the body. And that's important. And then it says, here's more judgment. For, when, for if we would judge ourselves, we will not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Hmm. That looks like we're risking judgment when we partake unworthily. And when we thought about the fact that if we take unworthily, what does that mean? That now means to us that we're not beholding what he did for us on the cross. But when you read this all together without any type of discernment, then you think that you, there's no way you could partake worthily. Like, who is taking communion then? No one can take it. If you, if you go through all these things and you have to judge, first of all, we should be taking a lot more time before communion if we have to do all this stuff. We have to discern. We have to judge. We have to think about our sin. We have to see if the, it's too much. It doesn't even make sense because even salvation wasn't that hard. That first word, judge, means to make a distinction. Now, we just talked about that, right? To make a distinction. And the second and the third judge means to pronounce judgment, but that doesn't always mean negative. If you're in a court of law and you have a judge that's here and he's, he or she is listening to your case, and then they pronounce judgment, their judgment could be in your favor or it could not be in your favor. It doesn't mean that it's a negative thing. It means that it's judging rightly. It's dividing rightly. So if we put all that together, this took me a minute. If you translate it and interpret it, and then that means this. If we distinguish ourselves from the world by partaking of the Lord's Supper, judging ourselves healed because of Jesus' body and forgiven because of Jesus' blood, we will not be subject to God's correction. Now that makes it plain. Sometimes the English that we, that's translated to and the English that we know today, they don't completely like match up. And then, but when you go back to the original, this is what it means. You have to judge ourselves healed. Judge what he did complete. Not judge what you did that's not complete. Because your eyes don't need to be on you, they need to be on Jesus and what he already did. And then if that, if that happens, then you're not subject to God's correction. Well, what is God's correction here? Well, he's correcting you about not being, not judging yourself already healed. It's not eternal damnation judgment that we know, like the great judgment day. Which, if you're a Christian, you're not even going there anyway. We will not be subject to God's correction. What's God's correction? Mm. If you think that you're not healed... After what I did for you, let me show you what it is I did for you. Let me remind you in my scripture what I did for you. 
Let me show you, because you are going down this wrong path, let me gently pull you back over and show you what it is that has already been done for you. And he does that through his word. He does that through teachings. He does that through that inward witness. Because if you really sit with this for a minute, and you go through your old self when you would think about communion, and you would read these scriptures, as you're reading them, you get that mm in your spirit when you're reading it. When you read it in the light of what you used to know, it doesn't even feel right based on the God that we know now. It doesn't feel right coming out of, in that, in that way, it doesn't feel right coming out of Jesus' mouth when he's talking about things. But let me remind you that what Paul is doing is he is talking to a church that is having problems with this. He's talking to a church that is not treating this with respect, that is not honoring this. Jesus is not the one who said you're drinking damnation to yourself. Paul is the one who said that. So, what, But when we get up here and we talk about communion and we're like, okay, well, it's found in multiple scriptures in the Bible and we pull them out and we forget the context of where it was said, then your mind just goes to the worst thing because that's what we do. But we need to go back and look and pay attention to what the context is because the context brings revelation and that revelation is going to bring you freedom every time. We are to remember the high price that Jesus paid. It, in 1 Peter 2.24, we almost, almost, anybody who's ever prayed for healing probably knows Isaiah 53.5, 1 Peter 2.24. Uh, those were maybe the first scriptures I ever learned in my whole entire life. It says, he who bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. If you even put that against what we just read, it doesn't even make sense. The Bible is saying that he bore our sins in his own body. Dramatic pause. He bore our sins in his own body. That we, having died to sins, did we die on the tree? Ah, uh, did we? Were we crucified with Christ? Yes, we were. So if, sin, if sin's dominion stopped at that moment, then we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. And by whose stripes we were healed. Now, in the one, in the, um, because this is a quote of Isaiah 53, 5. In Isaiah 53, 5, that's what it says in 1 Peter 2, 24. That stripe, because this is after he went and he got, he bore our sicknesses. He went on the cross. He was, he was beaten and bruised for us. That word stripes is actually wrong. It is supposed to be the word stripe, singular. And why is that? We have no children in here. That's because there was no skin left. Stripes indicates a, a delineation between. So you could see marks, which is something that the passion shows that there are these stripes that are on his back. Well, it's not. He had no more skin left on his back because all of our healing, all of our healing was provided. All of our sickness and disease were put on him. And he was, he was beaten and bruised for our deliverance. So much so that there was nothing left on his back. And then we're saying that we need to examine ourselves and make sure that we didn't have some ill thought about our husband last night or this won't work. It doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense when you read it in context. It doesn't even make sense anymore. But here's the problem. Religion, and I'm not going to point out any particular religion, but religion likes it, and here's why. Because if you examine yourselves and you make sure that you're acting right and you're doing right and you do all the things that you're supposed to do and take all the tenets of the church and make sure that you're doing them to the best of your ability, now you are under control. But here's the beauty of God. The beauty of God is that he has you under his control when you relinquish your control to him because you're walking in grace, because you know, because the, the Bible even tells you that the strength of sin is the law. That same Bible that they're trying to control us with says the strength of sin is the law. When you are told a hundred times you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, then that is the thing that you're going to do. But if you're going to say, you don't have to do that because I provided a better way for you, then you're going to walk toward the better way immediately. Maybe not. Eventually you're going to get there though. We need to start knowing why we do what we do.
Why are we doing communion? Why are we doing it consistently? Why do you need to do it all the time? Why do you need to have a revelation of it? This is why, because it changes from something that was meant to control you to something that was 100% meant to free you. That is why we're talking about it. That's why we do it all the time. Every time we meet, this is what we do. When we meet on Thursday nights for Bible study, we partake of communion. So, John sa- in John it says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. Now, that's Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. Pardon me. How is bread made? Well, you have wheat, and you take it, and you crush it, and you knead it. Yes, absolutely. And you sift it, and you pound it. And that speaks of Jesus' suffering for us. He is the bread of life. He, is, uh, he suffered for us so that we don't have to suffer. How is, because we have two elements of communion. We have bread and we have wine. Well, how is the wine made? Very similar thing. You take the grapes and you crush them and you trample on them. And then you sequester them in a dark place for a long period of time. And then they come out. And then it comes out a different thing than what went in. Well, doesn't that sound like what Jesus did for us? He was beaten, he was bruised, he was put into a tomb. And when he came out, he was something more than what he was when he went in. He now had paid for all of our sins. He, now we can go boldly before the throne of grace. So even the elements themselves that we use to take communion are a symbol, a reminder of what was done for us. They are a reminder of what he did for us on the cross, what he did for us when he was here on earth, when he stepped down from heaven for just you and just me. Did you know that in Acts, they talk about the early church? So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. They would gather to take communion. The early church would gather for that reason. But sometimes we're adding it as an add-on, as an extra, as a bonus to what we have in our regular church service. What he did for us is the reason why we have church. Remembering that is the reason why we exist. Partaking of communion with the memory of what he has done for us is powerful And it's not an aside. It is the main reason. They took communion every time. When you have an ailment in your body and you partake of communion, when you partake of communion, you take it with the idea of what communion is, which is a representation of what Jesus did for you. And you remember, when you take it and you hold it in your hand, and you remember, and you thank God for it, and you thank him for what he did, and you put your mental picture in about what he did for you on the cross, and you thank him for the healing that is starting, that happened 2,000 years ago, that you are receiving now, as you put it into your mouth and as it goes through as a healing salve through every cell and sinew in your body, that is powerful. When that's what you're doing, healing has to come. When the doctor prescribes you medication, you're taking it, what, once, twice, three times a day? I'm not saying do not take your medication. That is not what I'm saying. That's between you and Jesus. I'm not saying that you're a worse Christian. Healing, needs, healing comes whatever way. But do not neglect also taking communion. Because none of those things, whether it's good food, whether it's good medication, whatever it is, they don't work as good as what communion works for you. Communion, when I have an ailment in my body, I take it more more often than when I don't have a, a, a sickness because I'm going to remind myself. And I take it when I take my medication. You take it whenever you want. But if I'm taking antibiotics three times a day, then I'm taking communion three times a day. Why wouldn't I? Because I'm going to remember, it's great to say, oh, this, this antibiotic's going to heal me. That's great and wonderful. 
take your antibiotic, but also take what Jesus did for you. And every time. And you can do it at home because we've already talked about the elements are not anything in particular special until you partake of them. Do not be discouraged. We have many, many testimonies about people getting this revelation of communion and they are healed. Many people, they're healed instantly. And that's great and that's wonderful. Sometimes that's not how it works. I don't know that in my mature Christian life, I've ever been healed instantly. My healing happened 2,000 years ago, but did I ever see the manifestation of it immediately? I don't know that I have. I have felt better, though, and then the next time I feel better, and the next time I feel better, and the next time I feel better. So do not be discouraged if you take, because sometimes you'll read these testimonies, and you're like, oh, these are great, these are wonderful. All i got to do is go home and take communion real quick, and then we are ready. That absolutely could happen. But if it does not, the word of God is still true. And he still healed you. And healing is still your portion. And believe every time that you take your communion, that he provided for you, that you receive it in the way that it was intended. In the Old Testament, covenants were often solidified by breaking of bread, by a covenant meal. This is our covenant meal. This is an outward sign of what Jesus did for us. This is, we know that it's a sign, actually, of what happened at the Passover, about the salvation. In the midst of death and destruction, salvation was available to the children of God. In the midst of despair and of anguish, salvation was available to them. Look around the world. We're in the same situation as what they were then. Between school shootings and plagues and pollution and train derailments, all the stuff that's happening all around us, but we, don't, we are saved. We do not have to live like the rest of the world does. And I'm going to leave you with one more, more scripture. Because we've talked about what communion is, what it's a representation of, of the Passover being fulfilled. We talked about how Jesus said to do this between now and the time that I come. We talk about exactly what it is, the body and the blood, and that it changes when it enters your body and it changes who you are and the circumstances that you're dealing with. We talked about how it is a covenant. It is a picture of, it is a part of a covenant that Jesus has with you based on you no, and be thankful for that, based on who he is and what he provided for you, based on his goodness, based on his righteousness, based on his holiness, and all we have to do is receive it. We have the easy part, but we keep trying to make it hard, but let's remember this. It says in Leviticus, Leviticus, who ends on a Leviticus scripture? I do. Why? Because it's good. Leviticus says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Think about that. The life of the flesh is in the blood. That's why they couldn't partake of stuff in the Old Covenant. That's why you could not drink blood. All the stuff that they were not allowed to do because the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of Jesus is in his blood. Your salvation is in his blood. Your life is in his blood. When you are saved and you are now going to go to heaven for the rest of eternity, that's great. But the life to live in health is in his blood. So why would we not partake of communion as a, yes, as an outward symbol, but also as the reality and the remembering, this do in remembrance of what he did for you on the cross all the time. Because when that is more real to you than the symptoms that you're feeling in your body and the stuff that's in your checking account or not in your checking account or this craziness that you see around the world and when the blood is more important to you because you have put it on that level that it doesn't matter what I see, it doesn't matter what I feel, it doesn't matter what I hear. The blood is the life. 
you're completely unstoppable because now you've hooked up to it. So what we're going to, ushers, if I were on time for church, I would have asked you if you wouldn't mind going ahead and passing out communion because I'm just going to keep rolling with this. That is a beautiful revelation. You know what? He has made it so, so easy for us. I encourage you that when you are home, when you are home and you want to take of, partake of communion, remember what we talked about today. Read the scriptures with the new light that we talked about today. Read this as not something that you have to judge and make sure that you are right. It is what you're partaking of is your freedom. What you have is freedom. You have everything that he bought for you. You have his body that was crushed for you. You have his blood that was spilled out for you. That is powerful. What we're going to do is it's a little bit different than normal. Is we're going to, I want you to repeat after me because what, what are we doing? We're training how to do this at home. If you don't do it at home, we're training this is what you do. You don't have to say these exact words. Today, repeat after me as a template for what you're going to do when you partake at home. So first we're going to take the cracker and we're going to repeat after me. Thank you, Jesus for your broken body. Thank you for bearing my symptoms and my sickness at the cross so that I have your health and your wholeness. Mm, that's powerful. I declare that by your stripe, the one that you bore, the lashes that fell on your back, I am completely healed. I believe it. I receive your resurrection life in my body today. Take and eat. Amen. Ooh. Amen. Now let's take our cup. Thank you, Jesus for your blood that has washed me whiter than snow. Your blood has brought me forgiveness. It's made me righteous forever. As I drink, I celebrate and I partake of my inheritance of that righteousness, which includes preservation, healing, wholeness, and all the blessings that you promised to me. Let's take and drink. Amen. Amen. Expect results. Me telling you that we did not have to see something right now happen was not giving you an excuse to not expect for something to happen. Something is happening because he said it did. You don't have to feel it in your body. You have something more sure than what you feel in your body and in your mind right now. You have his word on it. You have his blood on it. You have his body on it. And that's what you're going to stand, stand on. That's what you're going to have. It doesn't matter. Oh, I left and my headache got worse. I don't care. I love you, but I don't care. Because we have a more sure word than what they said. We're just going to roll right into offering, too. I know. It's just crazy today, right? It's crazy good, though. So if we could, ushers, if you, if you would like an envelope, raise your hand. This is a wonderful part of the service. And here's why. Because you get to mark your money that you have in your checking account with, by saying, I'm giving part of this to the Lord. I'm giving all of it is yours. And I'm giving part of it back to you as a symbol that I'm giving you control of all of it. Because if you're, it doesn't, you know, biblical math and earthly math don't always match up. 
And it says in the Bible that we can expect even a hundredfold return on our, on our investment in the kingdom. And that's what I plan for. 30, 60, or 100 gold, I would take the 100. Thank you very much. So let's pray. Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us in this way that you've given us to give back to you in some small way. Lord, we give cheerfully. We don't give because you told us we have to. We give because we want to, because we are so blessed by you. We are blessed that you have worked in our finances up to this point, and we are blessed because it's stuff that we don't even know what they're going to do in the future. This we, money we have set aside just to say thank you for what you've done and to give a little back for you to do your work that you would have for us to do through this church and in this community. And Lord, I thank you for those who have given today and even those who have not. Lord, that they have a revelation and a prosperity that falls on their lives that goes beyond anything that they could ask or think. That we can expect that when we give, it is given back, pressed down, shaken together, running over, we'll then give to our bosom for with the same measure we meet, with the joyful measure that we meet, it will be given back to us again. We thank you for this opportunity to give it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 It is a good day. It's going to be a good week. It's already a good week. You just haven't seen it yet. Because why? Because we know that regardless of what circumstances come up, we know that we have a sure word. We know that whatever symptoms we have in our body, we have a more sure word. Whatever it is that comes against us that looks like something red and scary, like, abort, abort, abort. Uh-uh. You stay on your course. You stay on the course that God told you to stay on, regardless of what it looks like. Sometimes it means that you're on the right course. Sometimes it, when you're going down the road and you have a great victory, immediately something will happen that looks really negative. We don't go by that. We go by what God told us. It lines up with his word. And we're not going to lose that. So, you know what we're going to do today? We're going to stand to receive the blessing. Because that's a good idea. That is a good idea because we are receiving it with our whole body. We're receiving it just like we do communion from the top of our head to the bottoms of our feet. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you. Think about the Lord's face shining on you. In your darkest times, when you don't see a way out, when it looks completely dark, and the only thing that you think you can see is the train that's coming straight at you, no, the Lord's face shines on you. He is gracious to you. The Lord will lift up his countenance on you and grant you a peace that passes all understanding that you are walking in the midst of trials and tribulations that you have no idea how that smile is on your face and the song is in your heart. It's because God has put it there. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.